Yeah, welcome back. Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're here at the four o'clock block with uh, Marco Mangelsdorf for Energy 808, the cutting edge. And of course, energy touches everything. So this show touches everything. Hi, Marco. Hey there, Jay. Such a pleasure to be back with you. My goodness, uh, last time we were uh, together two weeks ago was a different world. And now what's the world that we have right now? We have Jay and Marco and we have the electrifying energy of energy topics, large, medium, and small. So uh, once again, my friend, great to be back with you. Okay, but today we're going to do a bit of an oblique. We're going to ask the question, what can Joe Biden do about climate change? And this was discussed in a, a PBS NewsHour piece a couple of days ago. It was uh, quite remarkable, uh, revelationary in its own way. So Joe Biden gets up there and says, we're going to do climate change in this country. We're going to rejoin the Paris Agreement on day one, he says, and we're going to reach, uh, what did he say? Uh, let me think, wait, um, by 2030, uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, we're going to, we're going to deal, we're going to, we're going to take uh, all, all the, the greenhouse gases out of transportation. And by 2050, we're going to take all the greenhouse gases out of everything. That's pretty aggressive, ambitious, don't you think? And I oh. guess the question is to discuss today is, Exactly. How do you do that? <laughs> uh, do you remember a wonderful song that uh, one Jiminy Cricket uh, sang with great acclaim uh, decades and decades ago in terms of when you wish upon a star? Oh, yeah. That Walt Disney. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the most beautiful tunes, I think, that can't help but giving anybody with feelings of chicken skin, right? So uh, to use that as an intro, I think... Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, going to be a lot of wishing upon stars, uh, which is not a bad thing, right? I mean, uh, you know, to get a bit um, Polynesian on you, Jay, of course, is what the ancient mariners from the South Seas, right? They use stars to guide their journey, both some successful uh, that we've heard about and some unsuccessful, right? To guide these double hull Polynesian canoes across thousands of miles of open water using the stars and the wind and the set smell of the ocean to traverse great distances. So you, you, we have to start somewhere to get back to where we, we need to, to be as a responsible member of the global community and the community of nations. So, uh, you know, it's music to my ears to hear Joe Biden uh, announce these top priorities for his administration. So to answer your question, you know, how do we get there from here? Well, uh, 2035 is of course, you can do the math as well as I can, let's say about 15 years from now, 15 years away. And he wants to make the, uh, what part of the economy again? Power generation, power generation. So uh, I think it's feasible. I think it is feasible to, in the next 15 years, I mean, it's, gonna, it's a rather aggressive uh, target, but to be able to phase out all power generation within the next 15 years, is gonna be a stretch. It's gonna take, of course, a substantial amount of money, but I do believe that is possible. Getting the US economy, so it's going to eliminate uh, all greenhouse gases in the next, uh, what, do we, what do you say, 2050, so next 30 years. I um, mean, that's also going to be quite, it's, it's also very, very aggressive. So how to get there, I mean, uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. It's going to take money. It's going to take trillions with a T and not billions with a B. And it's going to take adequate uh, political consensus to be able to move in that direction. And, uh, you know, all eyes are on January 5th, amongst other days, because that's the runoff day for two, count them, two uh, Senate runoffs in the uh, great state of Georgia, that uh, if, the, if the Democrats are able to prevail, which a lot of people believe is kind of a long shot, then that would give the Democrats control of the Senate with uh, Kamal Harris, the new VP, VP is the, uh, the tiebreaker. But uh, assuming uh, that doesn't go that way, then Mitch McConnell would be the Senate Majority Leader. And I guess the big question, big, big, big question is, is this the Mitch McConnell that used to cut deals with uh, Joe Biden when Biden was in the Senate for the decades he was there? Or is this the Mitch McConnell that is going to play the Merrick Garland uh, card over and over and over again, which is essentially to do everything in his power to guarantee that Joe Biden is a one term president, just as he vowed the same thing with Barack Obama in uh, 2008, 2009. So, uh, well, what do you but, think is going to happen? What do you think about Mitch McConnell? 
he's done some he's done some really heinous things uh, in this past four years. Do you think he's going to turn good? Oh boy, oh boy. Uh, I have to uh, I have to ask for a lifeline. Can I call a friend on that? Yeah, tell me you'll get back to me on it. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, you know, bottom line is, uh, is a couple of things. One is um, Biden said he's going to spend two trillion dollars. It's interesting, you know, the, the bandy about numbers like trillions, and yet we spent more than two trillion dollars already on COVID without any notable success. See how quickly it goes and see how much went into the wrong pockets too. That, that will come out in, in history. Although I would say it's very interesting when you look at anything that has happened in this four years, you have to take it with a grain of salt because there was an article today, uh, I think it was in the Atlantic um, and it, it was for the proposition that Trump doesn't take notes at meetings. He doesn't allow other people to take notes. He has systems that destroy his email and tweets as soon as they're sent and received in violation of the Presidential Records Act. Um, and when he leaves office, assuming he hopefully will soon, there, there won't be, a, there won't be a, a track of what he's done. A lot of the records that you, you, know, you find presidents leave behind them, he will not leave behind him. We won't know what he did with his hands behind his back. We'll know it was in the newspaper. We'll know what he said in his tweets, but we won't know what he did. And so that's, you know, it's very troubling to find. <clears throat> anyway, not, not to get too far off the point. Uh, one of the things in that, in that news story on uh, PBS that struck me, and a fellow's name was, um, mm, I want to say, Nat, Nat, Nat Dahani, who, right. who, who spoke about it. Mm -hmm. and, I think he is from Columbia, and he's an uh, environmentalist from Columbia University. Um, what, what's interesting is, is that we really, we really um, can't just join back into the Paris Accord. You've got to meet certain standards to be a member of the Paris Accord. And we have, we have been reducing our greenhouse gases by a very small amount over the past few years nothing close to what we would need to have reduced them to meet the standards of the Paris Accord. So it's nice that Biden wants to join on day one, but the, the Paris Accord membership will have to waive certain requirements for him to do that. And I think they will, but it just shows you how far off we are. It just shows you how, how pathetic our efforts have been around climate change. I mean, we look back at the four, the four years Trump has done nothing to work toward ameliorating climate change, and he's done everything to make it worse, in, including things that the automobile manufacturers felt were, were too drastic even. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do. And uh, in, that, in that piece, uh, oh, the show a couple of hours ago, we had a fellow who was talking about the uh, the multilateral trade agreement in Southeast Asia just recently established uh, for the lack of any American presence there. And he said, it's going to take uh, by not four years, but eight years to balance again in terms of world standing. And for right now, we're a laughing stock. Right now, they pity us. And, and they're not going to just, you know, <clears throat> open the door wide and let us come back. We're going to have to pay dues. We're going to have to show them we're sincere. And that's hard because we have a country that's so divided. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to push back a little bit on your Cassandra here, Jay, with a little bit of perhaps Pollyanna, because we need a little bit of Pollyanna here. Uh, I had a chance to look at uh, earlier today this information on the Climate 21 Project, Climate 21 Project, which actually has its pedigree from Duke University uh, originally with a whole bunch of uh, really top caliber people both inside uh, inside the academy, uh, former governor, government officials, and these, these folks have come up with a blueprint that they have been gestating with the hopes, of course, of a Biden victory, which we uh, have witnessed now, that would act as uh, recommendations, concrete recommendations to the executive branch of, uh, of the government, i.e. the Biden, president, Biden presidency, to allow his administration to, quote, hit the ground running, hit the ground running from day one. And as you mentioned uh, earlier, 
one of the, the as vet Biden has vowed that he on day one, uh, June 20th, excuse me, what a dear, wash my mouth out, January 20th, couldn't happen sooner, January 20th, that he will uh, make, uh, make whatever moves he can so we rejoin the, uh, the climate agreement uh, protocol, which uh, was uh, uh, arrived at after much negotiation, of course, five years ago in 2015. So I took a look at this uh, Climate 21 project and it actually seems to me to, it gives me some hope. It gives me some hope that there is a lot of firepower, there's a lot of optimism, there's a lot of determination to start the right the ship. Just take those steps in Munchkin land with Dorothy and Toto, you know, knowing they have a long way to go, a long way to go to get to Emerald City, but you got to start somewhere. In this case, well, for Dorothy and Toto, it was the beginning, you know, the Yellow Brick Road, right? For us, it's having pl actionable plans like this, uh, such as the Climate 21 Project, which is essentially providing suggestions, suggestions for each of the major parts of the U.S. government with the executive office of the president on down, including the State Department, Department of Energy, Agriculture Department, Interior Department, Department of Justice, uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and has specific recommendations in the first day, in the first week, in the first 100 days. And I mean, that is a start. That is a really mm -hmm. good start that this administration will be able to at least stop the bleeding of the past years uh, that has witnessed what we witnessed uh, from this particular Trump administration and start moving in the direction uh, that we all, or so many of us, uh, uh, feel that we need to go in. So uh, yes, it's daunting, Jay. It's, it, uh, it's really uh, a bit, an uphill struggle it's going to be. You know, you look at the politics, you look at the economic situation, you look at COVID, and at the same time, we do have something of a blueprint before us, and there will be a lot of good people coming into government at all levels of government that will have us starting back in, in, that, uh, in that more positive direction. Well, I, I don't mean to be on the other side of the coin with you, because I, I, I certainly believe in what you're saying, but I'd like to add two points. Um, you know, it's, it's the devil is in the detail. I think, then, uh, I think that Biden can um, negotiate his way back into COP, the, the, the uh, uh, Conference of Parties, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, pretty easily. They're all waiting. The mayor of uh, Paris, uh, when she learned that uh, Biden won, she said, welcome back, America. Welcome back, America. Uh, that is so profound. And it reminds me of the, uh, of the slogan that the French took up uh, after 9-11. Uh, I, I can't say I can't say it in French, but I'll try. Uh, nous sommes tous américains. Very we good, very good. Not bad, Americans. Jay. <laughs> Not bad. Nous sommes tous, nous sommes tous américains. Yes, yeah. yes. We are all American, and, and the same thing here now. Welcome back, America. Bienvenue, America. <laughs> oui, oui. So, uh, so I think um, you know uh, we'll we'll be able to get back in there. I think where I get stuck is in two things. You know, when Trump was, uh, you know, wrecking, uh, wrecking our environmental architecture, uh, he just repealed things. Uh, I mean, regulations and the like, which I, I guess there are issues about whether he had the power to do that. But let's assume he had the power to do that because everybody accepted it. So that was the end of that regulation, that regulation, that re very little pushback. What could you do? Um, now you want to rebuild that regulation. Uh, and Biden says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to do what I can short of legislation. I'm going to rebuild those environmental regulations uh, for climate change. Well, don't forget 70, 70 uh, million people voted, voted for Trump. Uh, don't forget that uh, even, if, even if the Democrats controlled the Senate, even if they controlled all of Congress, there were still Republicans left, Republicans to make trouble. Republicans to oppose everything, um, who don't like climate change and who would follow Trump, uh, who may still be a force in the media, uh, even after he's out of office, hopefully soon. And so what you have is um, a burden on the administration and the Biden administration. Well, I think we'll build this regulation back. And they say, not so fast. You know, we got, you know, periods of bureaucratic uh, response and, uh, you know, due process. You have to have hearings and allow for comments and, you know, all that Administrative Procedures Act kinds of process. Uh, 
And, and so they can hold it up, they can complain about it, they can try to negotiate it, they can try to you know, push back, in general, push back. So it's not so easy, it's easy to repeal stuff, it's hard to reenact regulations. You have to go through some, some gauntlet there. That's one thing. Uh, so I don't think we can assume they, that Biden can get it all back in, a, in the stroke of a pen, not true. The other thing is, um, of course, it all hangs on Georgia. And while you sing Disney songs about stars, I sing Georgia on my mind. I have even gone uh, to, to listen to uh, Ray Charles um, and he sings America the, the Beautiful, um, Amber Waves of Grain, and then he sings Georgia and it's got the same feeling about it. Georgia is America right now. <laughs> we, we have got, meanwhile, meanwhile, your friend uh, uh, Mitch McConnell is putting a hundred million dollars of Republican money into those two races in Georgia. It's going to be a struggle. Uh, even one would help, a two would be really good, but it's going to be a slugfest on that. And if, if um, the Democratic candidates for the Senate in Georgia don't win, we're going to have a terrible time. We're going to have a terrible time in getting any legislation through. I don't think there's a good bone in McConnell's body. Uh, I think he's going to resist anything the Democrats do because he wants the presidency back after the four years, because he wants to you know, hold the, Trump, the, the Trumpers together. And this is the way you do it. You keep on playing Trump. So the result is if he controls the Senate, Biden's going to have a terrible time getting legislation through. And as Kahani said in the PBS show, is, you, know, you can do stuff, certain kinds of stuff on regulations but for the serious money, for the serious, you know, climate change steps, you really de do need legislation in this country. And without McConnell, without the Senate, there won't be serious legislation. Sorry. Well, it kind of goes back to what I said uh, a little while ago, Jay, which is, is it going to be assuming that uh, the Republicans, uh, the Republican Party remains in the majority in the U.S. Senate? Is it going to be a Mitch McConnell of, uh, of obstructionism that he's shown certainly a propensity to do when there's a Democrat in the White House? Or is it going to be more of a Mitch McConnell of, of the days gone by where you give something to get something, you give a little to get a little, and a recognition that uh, the country cannot do, do the status quo thing, you know, whether it's COVID, whether it's the economy. So, I mean, these are all really juicy questions. You know, we still got a total of, uh, let's see, 14 days plus 31 is 45 plus, we have 65 days until January 20th. My, if I can do the quick math in my head. And uh, of course, a lot can happen as you and I know, both know in the next 65 days. Uh, there's this thing called uh, uh, executive orders, right? Which we're both familiar with, which uh, Barack Obama used. Uh, I haven't done a, you know, an analytical quantitative study to see whether Obama was issuing more executive orders than Bush did or whether the, more than Clinton did. So I don't have those stats right in my head, but he certainly was slammed, Obama was, by the Republicans for, you know, he's, he's acting as a king, as a tyrant, he's bypassing the people's will in the Congress and so forth and so on. So, uh, and it's something of course that uh, every president does because, uh, or to some extent, right? And Trump has been doing it as well in terms of executive orders. So. You know, that's that's certainly a fallback for Biden uh, to do because he, he does have a fair amount of discretion. But like you said, in terms of the really big stuff, you can't probably have a, of a, an executive order to come up with two trillion dollars. Right. To be able to fund uh, clean energy projects. I mean, that's a bit of a stretch. You probably couldn't get two trillion dollars, you know, siphoned away from the defense budget as Trump tried to. Well, not two trillion, but tried to siphon away a chunk of it for his border wall. Right. So, you know, let me kind of change the pace a little bit here. And this is, I think, a bit of good news since we're talking about billions and of, of, of dollars and, and hoping to see good things. Uh, one Jeff Bezos announced uh, uh, not too long ago a, an Earth Fund, Earth Fund of 10 billion with a B, $10 billion that he, Bezos being, I think the richest person on the planet, but, you know, when they get up to hundreds of billions, they kind of lose, lose count. But Bezos uh, uh, just recently announced, I believe it was today, the first recipients of, of money from the Earth Fund, uh, including a disbursement of 760 some odd million dollars, 
including $100 million to the likes of, let me just read this, uh, Nature Conservancy, the National Resources uh, Defense Council, Environmental Defense Fund, World Resources Institute, and World Wildlife Fund, to name a few. So each of those that I just announced or just mentioned, $100 million will come from Bezos's Earth Fund. So, you know, that's not a trillion dollars, but hey, $100 million is, is, is pretty good seed money. I mean, if I was in a, uh, at any of those organizations, I would certainly break out a good bottle of champagne getting that kind of news. So my point being is that you have private actors, in this case, a very wealthy private actor, who I happen to, you know, you could say all things, all kinds of things about Amazon's business model and having destroyed retail stores and da 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 da. Uh, but at least at this point, in this particular point of Bezos, you know, he's donating a fair chunk of money to do good things. So there, there's yes, yeah, seventy. It's, it's good, but you know, that's that's not the uh, that's not the optimal solution. The optimal solution is that the government has to take care of this issue, just the way the government has to take care of COVID. And if the government doesn't do something with an existential, existential threat like COVID or climate change, we're not going to make it. We're not gonna, this is anecdotal uh, compared with the kind of resources the government can bring to bear on a consistent basis. I mean, it just demonstrates that our government is really quite dysfunctional. Our democracy is quite dysfunctional. So let me remind you, oh, you already know, you already know that climate change, I mean, aside from COVID, it's a combination or awful. But climate change is an existential threat to the planet. And, and time is of the essence. And those storms in the Pacific Northwest, the melting of the ice caps, the change in the flora and the fauna around the world, uh, the, the, need, the need for all the people to have to migrate because the, their home environments are disappearing. This is a pretty serious business. And the US could be, should be, would be, maybe, the leader in getting that, you know, the global act together, but it, it's been a wall. Uh, Trump has been a wall, and we have allowed him to do that. Uh, so now it's time to get back to it and query. And we lost a lot of time. Are we simply too late? I don't believe so, Jay. I, I just, uh, I, I, I feel that sense of uh, despair sometimes. Of course, you know what, what normal feeling, rational human being on the planet so uh, wouldn't feel that. But I also choose to also believe that there are still plenty of people who are working uh, in the same direction that you and I are. And that uh, there's still, uh, I'd like to believe it's still not too late to right the, the climate ship uh, and have it go in the, uh, in the better direction. Uh, and and this, this is kind of a, I don't know, sidebar note or, or sidebar question to you, but I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. So clean energy. Clean energy. Notice that they're not talking uh, uh, renewable energy necessarily. Okay, clean energy. Is uh, nuclear energy clean? What about, and I, I kind of almost choke on saying this, clean coal? Is clean coal clean energy? So, I mean, is, uh, is, is nuclear energy going to, uh, do you think, should it play a bigger uh, part of our energy generation portfolio uh, in order to get us to to zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, within the next 15 years? You know, it's a really good question. We've been talking about, when I say we, I mean the planet. We've been talking about, um, you know, the, the kind of Green New Deal, uh, you know, that, uh, that, you know that, that the environmental community has been suggesting for a long time. We've been talking about solar. We've been talking about wind. Um, we've been talking about all kinds of, you know, ocean, harnessing the ocean. Um, gee whiz, is, you know, uh, for, that, for that matter, geothermal. Um, all these things that do not add greenhouse gases at all to the environment. But, you know, although Hawaii has made a certain amount of uh, benefit on that, a certain amount of progress, Hawaii has made as much progress as we would have hoped 10 years ago. Um, those those aspirational dreams and targets ten years ago have not been realized, and and I don't know if you agree with me, but uh, my feeling is we're not we we're not moving fast enough now. We've lost our mojo uh, in terms of Hawaii in terms of moving fast, and the country certainly is moving fast, and Trump has slowed it down. So what I'm saying is, while the existential threat increases, obviously, <clears throat> uh, clean energy in that sense. You know, no greenhouse gases, um, 
no, no fossil fuel. Okay, we, the world hasn't moved fast enough. It hasn't moved as fast as the threat has, has gotten worse. So if you ask me what could happen in the end is that we got to catch up. And catching up is by all means, all possible means. Um, and, 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 and a reasonable solution in the circumstances of an existential threat may very well be take anything that is less dirty, take anything that you can find that is reasonably clean and use that in order to uh, allay the existential threat. And that would include cleaner coal. It would include, um, you know, uh, LNG. It would include nuclear. That's what would, that's what could save us in the end. But Jay, you just said coal and, and LNG, they're both fossil fuels. So you combust them, you're putting stuff in the atmosphere. But so. less, but less. I mean, I think it's going to get to be an emergency where mm -hmm. anything that is better than what we're doing now is got to be considered. We're not there yet. Well, maybe we're not there yet. But you, know, you asked me whether these things were viable options. Well, no, we rejected them. I mean, you and me, the environmental community, but we're, we're losing ground all the time. The past four years, we've lost a lot of ground. So what do we do when it gets worse? Well, let me give you, since I know we're running, uh, we're, we're almost out of time here. I'll just share with you the, we, the news of last week in terms of geothermal, speaking of geothermal, is that uh, Pune Geothermal Venture is now back online. They are producing power, uh, according to press reports, it's only a megawatt or two, a megawatt or two, but you gotta start somewhere. They expect to be maybe up to 15 to 20 megawatts by the end of the year, and by up to full strength sometime, maybe early, mid 2021, full strength being somewhere shy of 40 megawatts. So, you know, through Mike Calacchini and Ormat and all of those uh, hardworking guys and gals, now they were able to go two and a half months with no revenue and still the revenue is, is very, very low with only a megawatt or two being produced for, for Silda Helco, but uh, they're back online. It remains to be seen, uh, you know, the, 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 the real fate of geothermal here on the island. There's still lawsuits pending, uh, accusing PGB of not having done a required or in, in the view of the plaintiffs a required environmental impact assessment, last one having been done 33 years ago. So, but at the same time, you know, the real world speaks sometimes and the real the world is speaking that uh, for now at least geothermal is back producing power on this island. So we'll, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, but I'm, you know, to me, that's, uh, that's part of this kind of um, inexplicable resistance um, to a diversified portfolio of, of uh, non-fossil fuel renewables. Um, and I'm, I'm sad to see that. I think it's related to TMT it's related to the cable between um, Maui and Oahu. Um, it, it's really, and, and the same pushback on geothermal in, in the same camp somehow. I think we have got to look a, at a longer view. We got to look at a bigger picture and we have got to stop fighting about everything. It really bothers me. There are some neighborhoods where they had um, large groups of people were consulted about whether they would tolerate wind in their backyard. And sure enough, as soon as the wind was built, oh, and they said, okay, they said, fine, we're, we're on board. As soon as it was built and people put in all that money, they said, no, we changed our mind. We don't like wind, now we're gonna fight with you about it. Um, that, that's really not, not cool. I think we have to make every step uh, an emergency step. We have to keep going. We have to be the best in the world. We have to follow through on all the plans. And once it's approved, let's do it. Well, I approve of you being my friend and still being interested in hearing what I have to say after all these years. <laughs> okay, Marco, this, you know, there's lots to talk about. And, um, you know, and energy is the centerpiece of, um, of our world these days. And um, that means that uh, it affects everything. And that means we should talk about whatever it affects. <laughs> here, here, my friend. Thank you, Marco. Marco Mangelsdorf, the time goes so quick. Thank you, my friend. Aloha.